From Srimad Bhagavatam from the sixth canto, um, chapter 17, entitled Mother Paivati Curses Chitaketu, text 37, you say, is on the board. No? I'm supposed to do two, is that how it is? Or? Huh? I see, okay. So then we'll first chant text 36. Shisukuvacha. 
Gita Sutta Bhagavata Sivas Yoma Bebasitam Babu Vasanta Dirajan Devi Vikata Vismaya Sri Sukha Uvacha Ite Shutva Bhagavata Siva Shoma Bibasitam Babu Vasanta Dirajan Devi Vigata Vismaya Sri Sukha Uvacha Ite Shutva Bhagavata Shiva Shama Vivasitam Babu Vasanta Dirajan Devi Vigata Vismaya Shri Sukhu Vacha Shri Sukhu Dev Goswami said Iti Thus Shutva Hearing Bhagavata Of the most powerful demigod Shivasya Of Lord Shiva Uma Parvati Abhibhasitam Instruction Babuva Became Shantadi Very peaceful Rajan O King Pariksit Devi The Goddess Vigata Vismaya Released from astonishment. Translation. Sri Sukadev Goswami said, O king, after hearing this speech by her husband, the demigoddess, Uma, the wife of Lord Shiva, gave up her astonishment at the behavior of King Chitraketu and became steady in intelligence. Purport. 
Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur remarks that the word Shantadi means Sviya Purva Swabhava Smritya. When Parvati remembered her former behavior in cursing Chitaketu, she became very much ashamed and covered her face with the skirt of her sari, admitting that she was wrong in cursing Chitraketu. And then we also continue with the next verse. Um, in regards to this verse, we can see that Parvati um, was very spontaneous when she responded to the situation of uh, where Chitra Ketu was apparently <clears throat> the writing Lord Shiva. Um, it appears that she responded without thinking about the situation and uh, that in a sense that was her nature that um, maybe she was not uh, as thoughtful and grave as, as Lord Shiva uh, and therefore Lord Shiva did not respond and Lord Shiva rather uh, let it pass and then later on Lord Shiva express, expresses how astonished he is to see this devotee Chitra Ketu. How when that devotee was being cursed, that still, still he remained completely nirapeksha, completely unaffected. And showing, showing really his, uh, his attachment to the Supreme Lord and showing that that's where he, his focus was in his, in his love for the Supreme Lord. So text 37. I'll just chant it alone. Iti Bhagavato Devya Pratisaptum Malantama Murna Sajagrihe Shapam Itavatsadu Lakshanam Translation, the great devotee Chitruketu was so powerful that he was quite competent to curse Mother Parvati in retaliation, but instead of doing so, he very humbly accepted the curse and bowed his head before Lord Shiva and his wife. This is very much to be appreciated as the standard behavior of a Vaishnava. Purport. Upon being informed by Lord Shiva, Mother Parvati could, could understand that she was wrong in cursing Chitaketu. King Chitaketu was so exalted in his character that in spite of being wrongly cursed by Parvati, he immediately descended from his airplane and bowed his head before the mother accepting her curse. This has already been explained. Narayana Prasarvi Nakutas Chana Bibyati. Chitaketu very sportingly felt that since the mother wanted to curse him, he could accept this curse just to please her. This is called Sadulaksanam. The characteristics, the characteristic of a sadhu or a devotee, as explained by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Trinada Pisuni Chena Tarora Pisahisnuna, a devotee should always be very humble and meek, and should offer all respects to others, especially to superiors. Being protected by the supreme personality of Godhead, a devotee is always peaceful. But a devotee does not wish to show his power unnecessarily. However, when a less intelligent person has some power, he wants to use it for sense gratification. This is not the behavior of a devotee. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananana Salakya Shakshuna Minitam Yenata Smai Sigurave Nama Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Advaita Gadadar Sri Vasadi Gora Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So gravity is an important quality in the character of a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava is by nature thoughtful Thoughtfulness 
is described to be a quality of the mode of goodness. Just like when Maharaj Pariksit came on the scene and saw how, how this bull was injured and he saw some dark figure with a stick right there at the spot, still he did not immediately impulsively act and attack uh, Kali, right, who was the perpetrator. Because there were other possibilities. What if Kali would have just passed by and would have somehow or other picked up the stick? In other words, what if he would not have been the one to break the legs? It's not necessarily so that whoever has the weapon in the hand is the one who actually committed the crime, although it's likely. <laughs> there is a good possibility. So in this way, Maharaj Pariksit took it, but just to, to make sure, uh, he inquired from the Bull Dharma. So Maharaj Pariksit was proceeding in a very thoughtful manner. He was not passionate. Uh, he was rather uh, very careful. Um, so that is, is a more favorable, uh, a more favorable attitude for a Vaishnava. Because Surasya uh, Dara, it is the razor's edge. Uh, as we, in shaving, uh, one moment of inattention, and oops, there you go. Uh, that happens from time to time when we shave. So it's like that. Surasya Dara, spiritual life also. A moment of inattention can cause very undesirable results. Of course, one can say that uh, Chitraketu, uh, was there a fault in Chitraketu? That is a question that we can raise. Should Chitraketu have just simply remained quiet? And should he not have made some, some comment about a superior in a way? All right, he said, how amazing it is that Shiva is sitting like this in an undressed state, his wife on the lap, in, an, in the midst of an assembly of, of sages. How amazing. Hmm. So should he not have said anything? Oh. Certainly, if he would not have said anything, he would not have gotten in trouble. And in that way, um, maybe it was unnecessary. It was not an offense because his intention was not at all to criticize Lord Shiva. His intention was rather to just establish how amazing Lord Shiva was. <laughs> yeah? That was all. But still, you know, he, uh, he volunteered this kind of remark in, in an assembly uh, about superiors. If he would have been like a little more uh, subdued, then that risk would not have been there. So we can also take that point. Uh -huh. Anyway, in this particular pastime, it is also quite clear that the whole pastime was ordained by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because later on, due to the curse, Chitraketu Maharaj will become Vritasura, uh, at least. He'll be uh, in the body of a demon. Uh, not that he will become a demon, because he will still remain, still remain the same transcendental devotee. It will not in any way change his consciousness. But at the same time, being a devotee in, in a ghastly demon body was not exactly uh, very nice for Chitra Ketu. So in that way, uh, as Vrita Sura, he was suffering in that situation. And when Indra was supposed to kill Vrita Sura, then Indra became afraid. Uh, he became afraid facing this very powerful demon. And, and it took Vrita Sura to say, no, no, go ahead. You can kill me. You can. You can do it if you use your, 
your thunderbolt, it will be done. It will be done. Huh? And then, okay, Indra eventually did that, and with that secured his position in the heavenly planets, and Ritasura, who was killed, went back to Godhead. Uh, so who was the loser in that fight? That is, that is the question. Uh -huh. So all these things are there. So we see that uh, bit the narration about, Chit, uh, about uh, Vritasura, we just went a little bit ahead in time uh, just to, to see that actually all this was ordained by the Supreme Lord because in the narrative of uh, Vritasura, it is stated that sometimes the Supreme Personality of Godhead arranges that his devotee comes in very trying, testing circumstances to quickly burn up the last remaining impurities so that that devotee becomes eligible to go back to Godhead. So sometimes uh, in the case of a devotee, Krishna may turn up the flame of purification a little bit and the boiling process suddenly is, uh, is increasing. So that may also happen in our life. Uh, anyhow, there are many points and points of etiquette coming out in this, uh, in this part of the Bhagavatam. Um, where the etiquette uh, was, uh, first of all, in the conduct of Chitraketu, uh, and then in the conduct of Parvati, and then in the response of Chitraketu, who, when he was cursed, accepted that in a very humble mood. Uh, so this is described as Sadulaksanam or the qualities of a sadhu. Um, to, to have this, this very tolerant mood and this humble mood, this mood of detachment about one's destiny. It's only possible if one is not so attached to one's destiny about what's going to happen. If one can simply accept, well, all right, you know, either I'm here now Somehow or other, Chitra Ketu is anyway an amazing personality because first he was that king who was overly attached to, to the family, then he becomes this very transcendental personality, but, and, and then he gets a plane and he's flying ar and around in this plane as, as, as the leader of the Vijadharas who are like uh, secondary uh, celestial beings right, glorifying the demigods and he is in that plane it's apparently a very large plane accompanied by beautiful ladies from the Vijadharas so then you're just wondering is he what did he attain and what kind of consciousness was there that as a reward for his uh, surrender and so on he's flying around in a plane with ladies already there we are a little conf confused. Then the next, it, as to his stage of consciousness, then he proves to be a very transcendental personality when he is uh, being cursed. Suddenly he stands there and takes the curse. Uh, we cannot fully understand where Chitraketu is in terms of his consciousness. Is he in... Is he in Bhava? Is he in Prem? Is he in Ashakti? Where is he on, in, in, in the process of devotional service? We cannot completely determine it. Um, in fact, uh, I had a quick look if, if, uh, if, if there would be any indication from the Acharyas. The only thing that Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said, well, his, his, uh, his prem for the Lord was so great that nothing could disturb it. Even the curse from Parvati could not disturb it. But that also, that's not really 
proof that he had already attained the level of Krishna Prem. Because we also find in the Bhagavatam, in the 11th canto, where it is said, Iswarata dadine su bali se su dvisat satya prema maiti kripu peksha yakuruti samadhyama we find the definition of a madhyam adhikari and it said the madhyam adhikari for Iswara, for the supreme lord he has prem Iswara tadadine su for the uh, for the devotees friendship maitri uh, then for the uh, for the uh, for the innocent uh, for the innocent there is there is mercy and finally for the dvisatsu for those who are envious there is nirapeksha there is there is detachment he is not at all interested in such personalities so such things are uh, described so prema or love is also there in an earlier stage, in the, in the stage of Madhyam Adhikari. It doesn't mean that that love is of the uh, same depth as the level of love that is displayed in Krishna Prem, but it's, it's of the same nature. Therefore, we're still not sure where Chitra Ketu Maharaj exactly was in terms of his spiritual advancement. Um, Judging it from that he had to go through some uh, some situation of becoming cursed and then becoming uh, entering into a demon body and then going through a lot of purification, still intense purification in a way. Uh, judging from that, one might suspect that he was not on the level of Krishna Prem and that he still needed further purification uh, in that life. So, uh, but that's maybe not the, uh, the main essence of the entire uh, story, exactly where he was. Uh, what is amazing is how he responded. How he responded to this heavy situation uh, of being cursed. And how he just became glorious at that time. Because he... He just stood up in such a glorious way, tolerating it. Just similar to Bali Maharaj, who was somehow or other uh, at, at, at the throne over the three worlds, seated on Indra's throne in the heavenly planets. And then uh, when Vamana Dev came and begged three steps of land, then he just surrendered even when Sukracharya told him don't do it Bali Maharaj just did it and gave everything and in that way Bali Maharaj became glorified and completely uh, uh, recognized for greatness although uh, Bali Maharaj didn't have so much of a previous history of devotional service and may not have known all the intricacies of the process of devotional service. Uh, in one sense, he was uh, still learning uh, about spiritual life. And, and uh, he didn't get it from his background, so to speak. At home, that's not what he learned, uh, because he came from a Daitya background. Uh, so in that way. Uh, but by his... Uh, resolve to just give everything to the Supreme Lord. He stood out in extraordinary purity. And then he's glorified for that. And then he continued that consistent. Uh, he was tested and he, he was consistent. He didn't change his mind even when there was no gratitude. He given everything, no gratitude. Just hanging just just arrest it. You promised me three steps, you gave me two. Where's my third step? For this you'll be arrested and here is this serpent which will strangle you and you can be caught in the strangling grip of this serpent and, and suffocate. And there's no mercy. And waiting, waiting, waiting and still no mercy. And only like, you know, when 
when his mother asked, you know, then what could Vamanadev do? Yeah. Then, okay, well, his mother said, let him go. All right, then, what do you do when your mother asks? Can't argue with that. So, in that way, Loi Brahma also added to it. So, the Pita Maha, the grandfather of the universe as well. So, heavy forces is what it took to convince Vamana to finally let go of Bali and give up on that punishment. But Bali never lost his faith. Somehow or other, he had that deep faith. So we see the same thing in Chichuketu Maharaj, uh, who started in ignorance as a king, overly attached to a child that had passed away and so on. So being on the bodily platform and then by the association of Narada becoming transcendental. And then uh, the next thing we see is the Chichuketu in this chapter now a transcendental personality and who shows the sadhu laksanam. So to draw a parallel with our condition, same thing, coming from, or worse maybe, uh, coming from a condition uh, with very little knowledge, coming from a condition with uh, many bad habits, coming from a condition where suddenly an incredible amount of mercy entered into that situation and the result is is that we responded somehow or other to that that mercy and that was our choice and we took up Krishna consciousness uh, for better or worse and somehow or other here we are uh -huh. and now we will also be tested as Chitraketu was tested, as Bali Maharaj was tested. Uh, devotees are being tested. And really, we can also expect to be tested in spiritual life. It's not from maybe we'll be tested, we will be tested. That is the nature of devotional service. Uh, we will be tested. And then, uh, these kind of uh, passages of Srimad Bhagavatam are, are guiding us how to act how to act in, in a trying situation where, uh, where we may have to face uh, strong behavior from the uh, from superiors, or if I can, for a moment, just take the liberty to translate that into our own environment. What if one gets mistreated by the authorities in the institution? That's, you know, that's, uh, that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse to leave Krishna consciousness. It's a very common, common uh, uh, excuse, uh, a justification found amongst many who have somehow or other found a way, found an excuse to give in to their mind and to allow themselves to return to material life. And the excuse is, what could I do? I, no one understood me and I, I was mistreated. You know, I'm just a soul whose intentions are good, but I was misunderstood. And then, as a result, as a result, I was mistreated and here I am, a victim of the situation. No, a victim of your own mind. And, of course, the mind is the seat of the senses. Therefore, a victim of the mind and the senses. Uh, the mind is constantly, constantly looking for an emergency exit. There's got to be one. <laughs> There's got to be some way. 
to get out of this. This is too tight. No, really, it's too serious. It's too much. I mean, we need a little more freedom, you know. Oh, gosh, a whole lifetime, just four regulative principles and only Hare Krishna all the time. Please, give us a little more something, something else, some freedom. Please, 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 please. Okay, no, no, we cannot do so because it doesn't make sense. Sorry, but according to transcendental knowledge, it is not possible to do all right, all right, all right, you know, okay, yeah, sure, yeah. You can't argue with transcendental knowledge, not very successful. But if there's a way out, ah. <laughs> and what greater way out than to blame somebody else? It's not due to my fault that I fell down. I was mistreated. I'm a victim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, believe it if you want to, but not very convincing. Maybe you can fool your mind, but I don't think you can, can fool anybody else. We understand very well what happened. Uh, we know the lower nature got the better of you, and you just found an excuse to facilitate it. No, sadhu laksanam. Uh, here it is, the instruction. Chitaketu, uh, being cursed. Cursed by who? By that personality who is worshipped here in Bengal, by so many everywhere, for whom they do big pujas with breakdance music and so on, to somehow or other pacify her. Yes, somehow or other pacify Maya. Pacify Maya coming in different years is Durga sitting on a, on a tiger, ten arms, ten weapons, and one of them is a trident. And the trident has three points, the three points of the three klesas, suffering from mind and body, suffering from other living entities, and suffering from devatas, from these natural circumstances. But that's only Durga. But what when Durga takes its angry feature and becomes Kali? Then it becomes intense. Pacify that intense goddess. Oh, she wants blood. Give her blood. As long as you take goat blood, not my blood. <laughs> uh, in this way, pacify the material energy. So many, so many are preoccupied with pacifying the material energy. Because, oh, the material energy can get very heavy. And Chitra Ketu was cursed by Parvati, by the mother herself. Material energy personified was upset with him. Now that's heavy. We all sort of, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. I hope nothing bad is going to happen. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. I hope everything will be quiet and peaceful. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's our mood. We don't want the material energy to be upset with us. But the material energy personified was upset with Chitra Ketu. And he was totally unaffected. I mean, he could appreciate its coming. Whatever was coming, he didn't know. But that it was coming. Whoa. When, the material, when you get cursed by... The material energy personified, what do you expect? Not much good, you know. Uh, not much good. Anything from earthquakes to meteors to, you know, horrible terminal diseases to, to whatever, whatever the material energy has in store. The whole variety of miseries. Well, what Chitra Keta could, got was a good mix. He became... He got a powerful demon body. And so big, reddish copper hair and a huge gaping mouth, he came out of a sacrifice. And what happened then was everyone ran and ran and ran just seeing him. So, you know, some of you say, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> but still, it's... 
ultimately it's it's not a condition for a devotee. So Chitra Ketu found himself in a body where he did not belong. Because by his nature, he belonged in a spiritual body. Which he then received soon after. Now, Vritasura, I, I say Chitra Ketu, I interchange the names Chitra Ketu, Vritasura a little bit in this uh, talk because I'm taking them as... A, I'm just following the same personality over two lives. Oh. So we're seeing what happened then. Yeah. It's quite amazing. Quite amazing. So we ourselves oh, are by no means as powerful as Chitraketu. We do not have the strength of character that Chitraketu had. Uh, and that Vrita, Shura, Vrita Sura showed. Uh, but it's for that that we read Srimad Bhagavatam and hear it again and again so that we can actually meditate on these things. See, it may not come spontaneous. If we get spontaneous, we may not act in the appropriate way. Therefore, better we be thoughtful and think about it and meditate about it so that when such a situation does arise that we can remind us of, okay remember remember it's supposed to be sadhu laksanam oh yes oh yes uh, that kind of that's what we require a meditation on the uh, uh, on the on the the right behavior and after prolonged meditation then yes then we might act properly in such a trying situation if we try and leave it up to what spontaneously comes out you know oh you're cursing me you know what I mean <laughs> we might curse her back you know I can curse also you know if you th so, you like cursing, do you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Pull a hair out of the head. <laughs> Throw some demon. Some varieties of things. Um, cursing, counter-cursing. Anger creates anger. Uh -huh. if, if we get spontaneous, someone's anger might just create a little anger in us. But one who is thoughtful, one who has deeply thought about it for a long time, one who has read the Bhagavatam again and again, even although internally not yet completely pure, may act appropriately. Okay, I'll stop and see if there's a question, a comment. In the beginning, like the, this incidence of Chitra Ketu Maharaj, uh, you said that he humbly accepted the curse of uh -huh. Parvati. Uh, the Bhagavatam uh, said it, I yes, didn't say it. Yes, I mean, like, he just quoted that. I'm quoting you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the Bhagavatam. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, the con I mean, the, the way like the conversation happened right after he was cursed, I mean, in the conventional sense, we don't see that as like, you know, like that's now how, in a conventional way, the way we live, we, we take it as humility because we are in a way taught that if you're humble, then stay quiet. I mean, if you are cursed, then just shut up, then just don't speak. I mean, how you felt like, like he accepted and all those things and he, he philosophized also. But generally, like, uh, that's how we are trained in that way. Depends where you're from. Yeah, maybe. Cultural conditioning. <laughs> where, I mean, maybe where you are from, you're trained in that way. Where I'm from, you're not trained in that way. <laughs> no, no. Where I'm from... <laughs> so what do you want? <laughs> So, different folks, different strokes. But even if we remain externally quiet, 
because we're trained that way, will we remain internally quiet? And, in, and externally we may stand there, but internally we are boiling and think, oh, I'll get him, I'll get him. You know, how does he dare cursing me? <laughs> and the cobra comes out. Yeah, so, um, it's the age of Kali. And no matter what our culture is, we just don't have the, the quality to give the depth to the culture. The culture of India may be that we stand with folded hands, but internally we do not have the depths. That can only come from being a devotee. And that's what the Bhagavatam is invoking. That internally, and how we can accept it? Because of detachment, because we don't care whether I'm here or there in the material world, you know what I mean? Swarga, pavarga, narakesu, apitulyartatarsina. Whether in heaven or in hell, always in, an, in the same state of consciousness. Mm. 8.45 has <laughs> passed. Okay, so I'll take one last question. Whoever is the most eager? <laughs> Whoever has the microphone is the most eager. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, I just wanted to ask what, what was the exact mood of King Chetraketu when he made a comment uh, seeing Lord Shiva and Parvati? If after... Yeah, well... Bhagavatam is, is explaining that Chitraketu Maharaj's mood was, uh, was not critical, not critical. He was just, just basically depicting the situation here. Lord Shiva, not dressed, wife not dressed, seated on the lap in an assembly of sages that seems to contradict all etiquette, you know. But see how amazing Lord Shiva is, how transcendental he is, how he's, he's not interested in such external things as, as clothes. He's not interested in such external things as lust. He's not interested in any of these things. He has only one interest, he has an unbroken meditation on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Chitraketu was aware of that. Just see the unbroken meditation of, of Lord Shiva and therefore just see these sages who know that and who appreciate that and therefore they are assembled here. Although externally it appears like an awkward situation, the sages you know, it doesn't seem like a Vedic situation, but the sages are completely uh, worshipping Lord Shiva for his unbroken meditation. And they understand this nakedness is not the ordinary nakedness of, of the mundane realm. Right? Like that. That was the moon. Okay, thank you all very much. Sila Prabhupada, Kija, Grantara, Sila Bhagavatam, Kija. I didn't speak, the Bhagavatam spoke. So the glory goes to the Bhagavatam. <laughs>